Good evening. Thank you for your prayers, both tonight and before tonight. <clears throat> Pastor Jeff mentioned something to our chapel devotion times um, within the, the, this week or last week. And he was reminding us of something that Pastor Shelton had said when he was here, that as we get together in the morning and have prayer time uh, before we start our day's work, that we do need to remember the ministries. Pastor Shelton used to say, if that prayer time stopped, so goes the ministry. <laughs> I think that's true of, of our, our times that we get together for worship too. Um, if the prayer stops, we can still meet, but it can be cold. And we need to remember Sunday, uh, Lord's Day, and, and Wednesdays as we get together to remember to, to pray. And um, thank you tonight for those prayers. If you would um, take your Bibles and turn to, again, to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 15, and if you would please stand, <clears throat> and read just a few verses out of um, 2 Samuel 15, we read this last week, or last month, but um, I'm not going to read as much tonight, but uh, verses 1 through 6. In honor of God's word, 2 Samuel 15. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared his chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man that hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. You may be seated. Let's just stop again and pray. Lord, thank you again for this time. Lord, as I've prayed before, if all this be as crumbs, may it be your crumbs. May it be your word. Take me out of the way. Protect from saying anything that shouldn't. May, may I have great respect for your word. May your word go forth and do its work, Lord, that we would all hear it. Lord, help that. This would be not in the power and strength of the flesh, but in the power of your spirit. Lord, there's no formula for that. We just ask, as each man gets up here, as Pastor Jeff gets up here, Lord, as we look for another elder, Lord, that all would, Lord, depend upon you. Lord, that you would do a work. Lord, do a work in our day that we will believe and trust and see your hand. Lord, you are working. Lord, we want to see more. Help us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We, we took up the subject of Absalom last month, and 
looked at this verse, uh, verse 6 in 2 Samuel 15. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Um, if I were to title this tonight, I think I would call it the manner of Absalom. We mentioned the last time that this verse, verse 6, could be divided into two parts. Um, the manner by which Absalom stole their hearts and the fact that he, uh, the second part, so Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And there, there has been so much to look at here. And as I've studied and got so far and then looked again, and I feel like I'm just scratching the surface over and over again. But tonight, uh, we want to begin to look again at, at this, of what Absalom did, that he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Now, we know that he did not steal the hearts of all the men of Israel. But in a real sense, I think that we might say that he stole Israel's heart. Absalom stole Israel's heart. Many in Israel forsook David, David their own king, and went after Absalom. Now, how did Absalom do this? What was the manner by which he stole Israel's heart? And I believe the first five verses of 2 Samuel 15 describe for us the manner by which he did this, the manner by which he stole their hearts. But I want to go back farther than that. I want to look at the events and circumstances that bring us up to chapter 15. And this point of how and the manner by which he did this. Absalom has a history. Chapter 15 doesn't just happen. I don't think Absalom just wakes up one day and thinks, this would be a good day to steal Israel's heart. No, there are blueprints to this structure. There is an iceberg that lies hidden beneath the surface of this text, verse 6, that supports the weight of Absalom's ability and the opportunities presented that all come together to steal Israel's heart. There is, within those first five, five verses, very specific ways that Absalom goes about to steal their hearts. But I'm thinking... And as I was looking at this and those verses and then all that happened before, there is an iceberg. And we see the top of it here, but there is many things underneath that bring us to this point. Absalom had a lot of ability. The man was full of zeal and extremely capable. But all this would still not have been enough without the right conditions, the right atmosphere, the right opportunities. The wind was conducive. The atmospheric pressure was conducive. The jet stream was conducive. And the temperatures in the Gulf were just right to produce this storm. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. We're in a battle today, and we're in a battle for the home. Every grace, every blessing, every promise, every ordinance, Every institution that God has created and ordained is being challenged in our day. Satan is out to steal, kill, and destroy not only individual lives, but the home, the family. 
He is ready, if he can, to sift our children as wheat. How we need the intercession of Christ, not only for our personal walk, but for our family, for our church, and for our nation. Now, Absalom had a sister named Tamar, and he had a half-brother named Amnon. King David was their father, but Amnon had a different mother. Therefore, he was a half-brother, but Tamar was Absalom's sister. Now, Amnon, by craft and deceit, worked out a scheme to be alone with Tamar, Tamar, and then he forced relations with his half-sister. The word says that Absalom spoke neither good nor bad to his brother Amnon. He didn't, he didn't speak good or bad. He didn't, he didn't say yea or nay. Absalom was quiet concerning this matter. And outwardly it appeared that everything was okay. That perhaps he didn't take this to heart. In fact, he even spoke a little bit lightly of it to Tamar. Consider it not, my sister. He is thy brother. Inwardly, though, Absalom hated Amnon for what he did to Tamar. Although Absalom restrained himself from taking any immediate revenge upon his brother, the seeds of murder were already rooted in his heart. And that is what sin does. This is the working of a grudge that takes hold of a heart and it will not let go. This matter, this matter of what Amnon did, there was plenty of room for righteous indignation for what he did. But at the same time, no excuse for a grudge. There is never, <laughs> never, I'm preaching to myself tonight, there's never an excuse for a grudge against anyone, period. Amen. Grudges can be hidden from the sight of men. Grudges can be hidden from parents or a spouse or a pastor, but they are no less real, and they wait for opportunity. A grudge may not express itself immediately, but it's there. If we allow it, it's there, it lives, it breathes. Unless by grace it is mortified by the, through the word and by the power of the spirit. And that is what it takes to deal with a grudge. It takes the word of God and the power of the spirit. Absalom is courting a grudge that he cannot deal with. He doesn't take it, it takes him, and eventually finds expression in the murder of Amnon. James says, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Matthew Henry says this, fretfulness and discontent expose us to the judgment of God. And we bring more calamities on ourselves by our groans and grudgings against one another than we are aware of. I think Jared mentioned tonight the Lord showing us our sin. Sometimes he needs to show us our sins. Often he needs to show us our sins. God told Cain in Genesis, but unto Cain and to his offering he, God, had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Friends, we can hide sin in our hearts. Or when we hide sin in our hearts and we don't deal with it, 
It lies at the door and waits for opportunity. Sin is never idle. Sin is never lazy. Laziness is a sin. Idleness is a sin, but sin is never lazy. It is always as a leaven, instantly working through the lump, and it is not satisfied until it leavens the whole lump. And this is true in not only our individual lives and hearts. It was true in Israel at this time. This is what was going on with Absalom and his manner and all the deceit and craft. And it is still true in the church today. Amnon may have forgotten all about this, but Absalom hasn't. Absalom hasn't missed anything. Nothing has been forgiven or forgotten. Absalom then uses the same kind of guile and deceit that Amnon had used with Tamar to get Amnon where he wanted him. Absalom orchestrated a, a plan and got his father's approval to get Amnon and other of the king's sons away from home, away from Jerusalem, and with his sheep shears, and then commanded his servants at the right time to kill him. You will find that in 2 Samuel 13. If you want to go back a little ways, I'm going to highlight a few things as we look at some of the past history here leading up to chapter 15. So, 2 Samuel 13, 28. Now, Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him, fear not. Have not I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. You know, it's so interesting he uses the words of Christian warfare here. But he's using them, of course, for evil purposes. Be courageous. Be valiant. Fear not. Have not I commanded you? Well, those are some of the very strong and, and encouraging words from our Lord and pastors and prophets in the Old Testament. Be courageous. Be valiant. Fear not. The first report that came to David concerning this was that all the king's sons had been killed. Then Jonadab, who was an evil man, and I'm not going to get into him tonight, but some very interesting things <laughs> that I came across with him, uh, consoled David that it was not all the king's sons that were killed, which raises a question, how did he know that? But it was only Amnon that was killed. And this is what Jonah, Jonadab said in 2 Samuel 13, 32. And Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. So Jonadab was, I think, a cousin. I'm sorry. I'd have to look again. It says brother here, but I think actually it might have been a, a a cousin, um, answered and said, Let not my Lord suppose that they have slain all the young men, uh, uh, the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this hath been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Another question of how he knew that but the language is strong here Absalom is not playing games notice it was by appointment this deed was on the calendar this had been determined and the word for determined can also be fixed so it was fixed in Absalom's heart and mind from the day that Amnon had taken 
uh, Tamar. No matter what things may have looked like on the outside, that he wasn't bothered by this, or whatever it looked like, Absalom did not waver from this. He did not waver from his revenge until it was accomplished. I think there are two things that are fearful here. One is when hatred and a grudge take lay, lay, lay hold on a man to the point that he begins to court that revenge immediately. His sin is planned and determined, and when he takes revenge, many are surprised. But as in his case, Absalom, he wasn't surprised. He had already determined it. He knew what he was going to do. Many others were surprised. I, this was a good-looking kid. I mean, he had to weigh his hair. Well, he didn't have to. That's a whole other thing there. Some real questions about weighing your hair, okay? <laughs> um, the other fearful thing about this is when someone harbors a grudge so long that when the opportunity for revenge presents itself, they surprise themselves by their sinful action. Words come out that they had not planned. Actions and behaviors spring forth that were not necessarily premeditated, planned, fixed, but they are no less out in the open. Both are dangerous, and both need to be dealt with, repented, and mortified. Folks, we don't have to live that way. Praise God, we don't have to live that way. God in Christ has made provision for our obedience and joy. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Christ is sufficient to meet us right where we are and to give us the strength of his spirit. And do temptations come? Yes, they do. But he giveth more grace. I thought about that song. He giveth and giveth and giveth again. No matter the test, no matter the trial, no matter the temptation, Christ giveth more grace. And listen to this scripture in Leviticus. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thy heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. You know, part of loving our brother is to not only keep ourselves from bearing and, and holding a grudge, but also not to suffer sin upon them. It's not enough to just keep ourselves from a, gr a grudge. There, there's both a positive and a negative command here. And, and they have sh equal share of us demonstrating love to the brethren. One closes the mouth, the other opens it. But it's still love. This command ought to be practiced in our home as well as in the church. And it's twofold. Husbands and wives and children should keep themselves from grudging against one another and recognizing and dealing with the very first thoughts or the seeds of it before it germinates. And to not suffer sin upon one another. Well, after the murder of Amnon, Absalom flees to Geshur. And this was where Absalom's mother was from. His mother's name was, I didn't practice this, Maka, and she was a daughter, a daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. So we, he would have been with family, in a sense, because it would have been on his mom's side, and perhaps he felt safe there. So he fled to Geshur, and we see that in 2 Samuel 13, uh, 37. 
But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amenahab, Hud, uh, king of Geshur, and David mourned for his son every day. Uh, previously, when David's sons had all arrived back after Am Amnon was killed, the word says that, that they, David's sons, when they got back, lifted up their voices and wept. And then it says, then David wept. And then it says, all the servants wept sore. What, what a grieving time that must have been when Amnon was killed. But now David begins to mourn for Absalom. And he mourned for his son every day. Not a day went by that Abs or David was not thanking and grieving for Absalom. David loved Absalom. And then we read in 1338. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur, and he was there three years. And the soul of King David longed to go forth unto Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon, seeing that he was dead. So here again, David's, David's soul, it said, longed for Absalom. There was nothing that could be done for Amnon now. He was dead. And David was eventually comforted as much as a parent could be concerning the loss of this child. But Absalom was still alive. And friends, where there is life and breath, there is hope. And David's soul longed to be with his son again. This consumed David. I imagine he could not eat or sleep or even care for Israel as their king without thinking of Absalom. I think it affected his work and his duties even as king. Now when Joab, which was David's general perceived that the king's heart was towards Absalom, he worked out a plan to get Absalom back into David's fellowship and care. Now think about this, because this is what Joab wanted to accomplish. This was the basis. It wasn't just get a family member back home. Uh, back to the family. I think it was more than that. It would include that Absalom, a criminal who had committed murder, would be back in the king's court, back in the king's presence, and back in the king's approval. He, he was going home run here all the way. This meant that Absalom would again have all the status, access, and privileges of a king's son. As though he had never done anything wrong. He had lost all this when he murdered, murdered Amnon and fled to Geshur. So Joab sent for a woman to disguise herself as a mourner and to present her sad case before the king. This is in chapter 14. We won't read it, but let me try to summarize it. David, uh, okay, present her sad case to King David concerning her having two sons, and they strove together. And one rose up against the other one and killed him. And now the whole family would have uh, put the living son to death. And if the king, King David, didn't intervene on her behalf, she would lose both sons. Then she said, they shall quench my coal, which is left, and shall not leave to my husband neither name nor remainder upon the earth. Yeah. Just putting yourself in David's place, wouldn't that pull some strings there? <laughs> It would. And Joab 
uh, who was, um, well, let me, let me say this first. Certainly this story had been drawn, had been put together to draw King David in and cause him to relate it to his own situation. Joab knew that David was not only a man of war, but he also had a tender heart. That's something that other kings even knew. I mean, they even said, we know that Israel, their kings, they, you know, they can be tender. Maybe we need to fall to them. So, and David was. He, he was a man of war, and he knew how to be tender as well. Part of the problem there is no one does that as perfectly as Christ. He can be perfectly tender, loving, and perfectly judge judgment, and they blend together to the point that righteousness and truth, I, I, I can't quote it, righteousness and peace kiss one another. The Lord, our Savior, is perfect in this matter, but... Um, David was not, but he could. He knew how to be uh, tender, and he was also a man of war. Joab was sure that this woman could draw out the kind of natural affection necessary to pave the way for Absalom's return. Joab was a great military leader, and as great as he was as a military leader, he was often a thorn in David's side. And although we do not necessarily question his intentions here, it would seem that he did act presumptuously upon David's sentiment and natural affections for Absalom. And friends, I believe that this actually opened the door to further harm and rebellion. Why would we say that? Why would we even question David bringing him back and his natural affections? What else should a father do with a wayward child? How could we expect David to do anything else? David loves Absalom. Would not a loving father bring his banished son home? Uh, these are hard questions. But it can be the difference of our child's salvation. Affections, of course, are not wrong in themselves. In fact, something is wrong if we do not have any natural affections. Paul warns Timothy of perilous times to come. And he says this in 2 Timothy, This, I, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. The list actually goes on from there, but what a company for that list of sins and to be without natural affection is right in the middle of it. So, certainly we are not saying to be, we don't want to be without natural affection. Don't we see that in our day? Parents who have no natural affection for their children, and children who have no natural affection for their parents. I don't I don't know how a child I don't know how a parent can can leave a child um, and um, they they go into a foster home and, and they don't care. I, I don't know how I don't know how a mother gives up their child. That to be without that kind of natural affection. There may be situations, and, and perhaps they need to give it for 
uh, adoption in certain situations, but you would think that would have to be a heart-wrenching struggle. How, how do they do that? Do we not live in perilous times? And one of the prevailing sins of our society that affects home, church, our, our neighborhoods is to be without natural affection. One of the things that Pastor Jeff said recently about the conscience was that the conscience has to be informed biblically. That the conscience by itself is fallen and affected by sin, and it will lead us astray. Even though it was made to examine, judge, and correct our behavior and action, Yet, because of the fall, if it's not biblically informed, it can lead us astray. And I believe that we could apply that to natural affections as well. Our natural affections must be informed biblically and controlled by the Spirit, or they could lead us astray. Many affections, though good in themselves, can lead to a multitude of sins if not governed by the word and the spirit. Our, our emotions will run for office constantly, but if they're elected, they make horrible governors. They will run the ship aground. And this must be guarded in our home. Part of David's hope in Absalom's turning from his sin, admitting it, taking responsibility for it, humbling himself before God and man, pleading to God for mercy, forgiveness, and for restoration was the consequences of his own sin. David's hope for Absalom was that Absalom was facing the consequences of his own sin. The reason that Absalom was in Geshur was because of the consequence of sin. And as I said earlier, Job's plot to bring Absalom back would now put him in the same position and privileges that he had before he killed Amnon. Part of our hope as parents for the salvation of our children is that God would deal with them in their sin, and in the consequence of their sin. By our correction, and it, as we administer that discipline and correction, there has been times when the Lord has disciplined me because I failed to discipline my children. Jesus said in Matthew <coughs> Jesus said in Matthew, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And we know the key phrase there is more than. More than. He that loveth father, mother, son, or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He does not say and teach a lack of love or affection in the family. When we do the things that Christ commands us to do concerning our families, we demonstrate the same love for God that Abraham showed when he took Isaac up the mountain to offer him a sacrifice for God to God. And as we shall see, that this cunning plan of Joab worked, and he secured permission from David to go and fetch Absalom. So then we read in 2 Samuel 14.23, 14.23, So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, Let him turn to his own house, and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. 
uh, let's stop here for a minute and look at this. Absalom is back, is brought back to Gesher. He is in Jerusalem now, but he still cannot see the king's face. And it would seem that this was almost like a chess game. Not that David's trying to play games, but both sides seem to be at a stalemate. And there is a lot going on here, I think, under the surface. This is part of that huge iceberg that's underneath our text, where we read that Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Joab has, through worldly wisdom, brought Absalom back to Jerusalem, but David is not at peace. He, he's not at peace. He is having a hard time with this. What is going on? His soul had longed to be with Absalom. David had spent hours mourning over his son, and now he's back in Jerusalem. But David refuses to let him see his face. What is wrong? I believe that David is having trouble because he knows that there has been no justice done in this manner, manner, matter. He knows that his son is a criminal. He knows that Absalom stands guilty before God and before God's law as a murderer. He knows that the nation has witnessed this crime, for which there has been no justice. Let's not forget that David was a godly man. In spite of all his sin and failures and faults, he loves God. That could be our testimony, too. I heard, I heard one man say one time, he said, I may fail in a lot of areas, but when I die, my testimony, it will, it will be a testimony for me if people know that I love the Lord. Not, not that we exalt sin, certainly, but we are sinners. We need God's grace daily. Absalom... David's son has sinned, and he has sinned greatly. He has committed murder. And according to the law, his sin actually requires the death penalty. David knows this. He's not ignorant of the law. There, there have been now two great sins committed, committed in David's family. Amnon has raped Tamar, and Absalom has killed Amnon. And there has been no justice done concerning either of these crimes. David's sons have sinned against God and man, and their sins have been weighty, and they have affected many, even the whole nation. Yet still, no justice. David himself has done nothing concerning their sin. Although he was angry with the one and grieved over the other, he's done nothing. David has, it seems, been silent concerning their sin. Silent. Not a word. And remember what we just read. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Consider this also. Would not David be aware painfully aware that he himself had been guilty before God concerning the same kind of sins that are now in his children. David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and later had killed Uriah, who was a loyal soldier in his army. These sins have now repeated themselves in David's family, even as Nathan the prophet prophesied. Nathan told David just a few chapters back, the sword shall never depart from thy house. Now we, do we have permission here to think and imagine a little bit of what David might be thinking, his thoughts. 
would not the words of Nathan the prophet bear heavy on David's mind and heart right now? Would not his conscience echo these words back to him? The sword is not going to depart from your house. David knew well that he was still bearing the weight, not of the sin, but of the consequences of sin. Sin was forgiven. David was forgiven, but the consequences were long-term. Friends, this could weigh heavy on the mind. And in the home, the mind is a battlefield. This is often where Satan attacks us. It is here that the enemy comes in like a flood to confuse and accuse the child of God. David is under attack, and he is under spiritual attack. Saul's armor will do him no good right here, even as it would not in the battle with Goliath. David needs to be armed with the spirit and the word, and we need the whole armor of God in the battles that we face in our families and homes. This is why the Apostle Peter warns us, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, and be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's a, there's a place in Pilgrim's Progress where Christian meets Apollyon. And at first it was just words. But then it became a fierce battle that almost did away with Christian. At least he felt, felt it so. The whole scene, I think, could apply to what we're speaking about, but I just want to highlight part of the conversation. Apollyon. Thou hast already been unfaithful in thy service to him. And how dost thou think to receive wages of him? Christian, wherein, O Apollyon, have I been unfaithful to him? Apollyon, thou didst faint at first setting out when thou wast almost choked in the gulf of despond. Thou didst attempt wrong ways to be rid of thy burden. Whereas thou shouldest have stayed till thy prince had taken it off. Thou didst sinfully sleep and lose thy choice things. Thou wast also almost persuaded to go back at the sight of the lions. And when thou talkest of thy journey and of what thou hast seen and heard, thou art inwardly desirous of vain glory in all that thou sayest and doest. Wow. These are heavy accusations. And they can at times loosen our grip from the sword. Remember, the devil is accuser of the brethren. And he gets a lot of mileage sometimes out of his accusations. But listen to Christian's response here. Oh, this is encouraging. Christian, all this is true and much more, which thou hast left out. But the prince whom I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. Glory. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, will never get victory arguing with the devil. But it, the word says, resist him steadfast in the faith. Now, make no mistake, David's sins are forgiven. They were forgiven. I couldn't believe that. Um, I, I was going to write this down. I didn't, so I'll do it from memory. But when, um, when Nathan said, thou art the man, and began, began to show David the consequences of his sin. At the end, David said, I have sinned. I have sinned. He confessed it. 
And immediately, immediately, Nathan said, the Lord hath forgiven you. Immediately. David knew the grace of God who pardons iniquity. But the forgiveness of sins does not make void the consequences of sin. There are still consequences for our sins. We may be saved now, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, justified by his grace, forgiven of all our sins and iniquities, and still suffer the consequences of sins committed even before we were saved. But listen... That does not mean that we are not truly saved. No, a thousand times no. For, this, for the devil to accuse the Christian in such a way is a lie from the pit of hell. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Now, how can we as parents discipline our children for things that we are guilty of? That seems to be a tough one. It could be a tough question. How can we as parents discipline our children for things that we are guilty of? But, but let's turn that around and ask this. In the light of all the consequences that we have had for our sins that we have suffered... Can we afford not to judge sin in them, in our children? David, I think, is having a hard time judging sin in his children, and he is not alone. I think we all struggle with this at different levels as parents. We all want peace in our homes, but there is no real abiding peace without truth. As parents, we cannot compromise truth for the sake of peace. This should cause us as parents to deal ruthlessly with our sin. De uh, sa Satan does not care what keeps us from disciplining or correcting our children. He doesn't care. He doesn't care whether it's true guilt or false guilt, as long as we do not obey Christ. And if we are going to deal honestly with our children, then we must deal honestly with God concerning our sin and our guilt, the true guilt, and confess and repent and go on. David was forgiven, but... At this time, he was still bearing the consequence of his sin. It was right before him. Everywhere he turned, the consequences of his sin were right before him. This seemed to become somewhat of a blinder to him in dealing with Absalom. So then... We see in 2 Samuel 14, 28. 2 Samuel 14, 28. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. Absalom has now not seen his father for five years, three years in Gesher, and two years back home, but not able to see the king. Absalom separated himself from David and from his own countrymen by fleeing to Gesher. He spent three years there before Joab went and brought him back, and now two years in Jerusalem. He's still on probation. Absalom is still being watched. All Israel knows that he does not have David's approval at this point. When Joab brought Absalom back, David gave very specific orders. 
He can go to his house, but let him not see my face. Boy, that could seem kind of mean, too. I mean, it does to our flesh. It seems mean to our flesh. Absalom still needed that consequence. He still needed that. Um, okay. Um, so King David commanded, his commands was very specific, and Absalom is now getting tense and restless. In 2 Samuel 14, 29, it says, Therefore Absalom sent for Joab to have sent him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Absalom has called for Joab, and he wants Joab to again act on his behalf that he might have audience with the king. Absalom, or Joab's already helped him once, brought him back from Gesher, but now he still can't see the king's face, and Absalom is getting restless. In his mind, he must see the king. And he is demanding this. Joab is David's military general. But to Absalom, he's just a pawn. Just another piece to be maneuvered. It says in Proverbs 19, 19, A man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. But if you deliver him, yet thou must do it again. Absalom is certainly a man of great wrath and anger. And if you deliver such a man, just plan on it. You're going to have to do it again. 2 Samuel 14, 29, again, same scripture. Therefore Absalom sent for Joab to have sent him to the king, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Twice now, Absalom has piped, but Joab has not danced. So when that didn't work, Absalom realized that he didn't always get his way and that the Lord was trying to teach him something and that he should rethink some things and examine his ways. No, he didn't do any of those. That would have been a good first step, perhaps, along with some repentance, humility. But that is not what he does. When Joab didn't come, Absalom sent his servants to burn Joab's barley fields. And this, of course, brought Joab right away. Which is what Absalom expected to begin with. And we read that in 1431. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom and to his house and said unto him, Wherefore have thy servant set my field on fire? Just a side note here. If, if Pastor Jeff doesn't answer your emails right away, don't get the matches out. So do we get the picture here? Uh, don't mean to put it quite that way. Do we get the picture here of, of Absalom, of who he is, a sense of his character or the lack of it? This is a wrathful, angry, hateful man. In Proverbs twenty two twenty four, it says, Make no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. We do have to be careful who we keep company with as far as fellowship goes. Not that we won't have people that we know and love who are this way, but fellowship, talking about fellowship here. Make no friendship with an angry man, 
And with the furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare unto thy soul. In our day, we might say that Absalom was a spoiled brat. Here is a man who is used to getting his way, and even now, as he has manipulated Joab to come to him, he is the offender, and yet he is demanding action and immediate response to his own will and desire. Absalom is waiting on no one. Here is a man whose will has never been broken, never, never, never broken, hardly restrained. And you are not going to tell Absalom no. Uh, this is so sad. I, here was a grown man. What did Pastor Clarence used to do? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Esther and I attended a church in which uh, a family started coming, and they had a six- or seven-year-old boy that time, I believe. Uh, I believe he was six or seven, and they had a daughter who was a few years older than him. He was a handsome young boy, but he had a temper. This boy would sit... On the inside of the pew, facing the aisle, and there was a lady in the church who sat a few seats back on the opposite side of the aisle. <clears throat> when this boy would act up in church, she would watch him, and she would look straight at him, hoping, I think, to shame him into behaving himself, but this usually just made him mad. And when his parents were not watching, he would take his finger and spell the letters N-O on the side of the pew in front of her. No. He would write those letters and then he would glare at her and grin. No shame, no guilt, no remorse, no restraint. Now you would think that a look of disapproval from an adult would cause a little bit of shame, a little bowing of the head, turning the head away, looking down, it, it didn't. It didn't. You could not shake him. He became more brazen and more rebellious and more ready to demonstrate that in ways that were hidden from his parents but clear, clear to others. Friends, this is the depravity that we are all born with. We may not carry it out to that extent, we may not be writing no on the side of the pew, but until we are regenerated, there is enmity in our minds towards God. Romans 8 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Friends, the difference between the saved and the lost, the regenerate and the unregenerate, is whether the Spirit of Christ is living and dwelling in us. When we see Absalom, we see a picture of ourselves outside of Christ. This is who we are outside of Christ. And we could all testify the same thing, but for the grace of God, there go I. 
were made of the same stuff. How many before you were saved sat in church and heard the word preached and still wrote no and stopped your ears and hardened your hearts? That is our nature before the Lord saves us. Now, in closing tonight, uh, we asked a question last time, where is your heart? Where is your heart? And I, I think that applies to the context of the family. In, in Proverbs 23, 26, it says, My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. What a term of endearment. My son, give me thine heart. We mentioned last time on this question of where is your heart that we could take that both vertically with our relationship with God or horizontally with man to man. But I certainly think it applies to children and, and, and parents. Just what Solomon has said in Proverbs. My son, give me thine heart and let thine eyes observe my ways. Children, where, where is your heart? As long as you are under your father's roof and under his care and protection and authority, that is the safest place for you and for your heart. The safest place. <clears throat> we are... Of course, not speaking of the exceptions here, there are always exceptions, but look around. There are no perfect fathers here. But the safest place for your heart as a child under your father's roof is your father. David never won Absalom's heart. And that, of course, has two sides. David had a job in that. And, and we know that even as a man after God's own heart, he still failed at being a father. And he'd be the first to admit it and the first to look to the Lord for help and forgiveness. But it's also Absalom's responsibility. And when Absalom stands before God, he is going to stand before God for what he did. This, this call to being a father and a mother is a, is a high calling. We are to be, in a sense, prophet, priest, and king in our homes. What a high calling. Someone would have to step down to be the president of the United States. And then after I wrote that, I thought, not sure that's a good point. But you would. You'd have to step down. We may not have a direct promise for our children to be saved. But I think if we search his word and obey his commands, we, we can plead for our children. Christ has not left his people without hope. He has not left parents without hope. We find fathers and mothers in Scripture coming to Christ, begging for their children, asking, seeking, knocking. There's a, there's a, a promise in Acts 2.39. Again, there's nothing automatic here, but there is a promise that says, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. A promise. Yeah, that's wonderful. A promise for you and your children. We should go to God expectantly, with expectant faith for our families. And I think we could sum up tonight with a verse in the Old Testament. 
It's the very last verse of the Old Testament. The last book of the Bible in Malachi, the last chapter of Malachi, and actually the last two verses of <coughs> Malachi before we get to the New Testament. Behold, I send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. May we remember the forgiveness of Christ for our sins. The sanctification that surrounds even the consequence of our sins. The commands of his word, teaching and training our children. And the help and the power of his spirit to obey Christ more than our closest relationship. Your, you children, you children who are not saved, or perhaps maybe even an adult, turn to Christ Turn to Christ tonight. Today is the day of salvation. See that man hanging on the cross dying for sinners. See him there for your sins. Don't think, well, if the Lord would show me my election, then I will believe on him and serve him. No, no, as Martin Lloyd-Jones would say. I love the way he said that. No, no. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him and repent of your sins, whether you see your election or not. Some of us want to see first and then we'll believe. It doesn't work that way. We must believe and then he shows us. Then we will need to make our calling and election sure. Believe on him. Trust Christ. Roll yourself on Christ whether you see your election or not. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Friends and brethren, <clears throat> may we press on in the battle for ourselves and our families. May we continue to pray and seek God for salvation and sanctification of our wives, husbands, fathers, mothers, sons, and daughters. Amen. Would you please stand for the benediction? <clears throat> Thank you if I held you extra long. Uh, Hebrews 13, 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. <clears throat>